Awesome. Good evening, everybody. So good to see you all back online. I'm still trying to get my screens just right so that I can see everyone as well as um, see the the um, the chat section because I need for everybody to get involved in tonight's lesson. Um, tried to make it a little bit interactive. Want to make sure that you know we're we're really talking. You know, iron sharpens iron, and so really want to have a robust discussion and everything about. Um, about the Bible, about the good word, good news of the gospel. So here we are, another Wednesday night. It's hump day, hump day, hump day. <laughs> and so let's get started. Um, let's just bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, oh God. Lord, you are so good, Lord. You're so merciful and you are so kind, Lord. Thank you, God, for this moment in time where we can study your word, oh God, where we can sharpen ourselves, Lord, as we, Lord, um, dive into your word. Help us, Lord, to understand what it is that you said and what it is that you are saying to us, oh God. Make us even the better, oh God, Lord, that this word, Lord, would not just be tickling to our ears, oh God, but that it would um, penetrate into our hearts, oh God, and into our actions, oh God, that we would be better because of what we have heard and discuss and study tonight. So we invite you in to have your way, oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I am going to share my screen. Uh, and I believe this is the right screen I'm sharing. <laughs> that's what happens when you have too many of them up <laughs> yep we're seeing body ministry all right good and let me just make this bigger because somehow when I did that I lost the chat uh, <laughs> where's the chat okay I got it now I got it all right so um, we've been talking for the last couple of weeks, and thank you, Reggie, for taking on last week with talking about um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, we've been in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we've been talking about body ministry. We've been talking about the divisions that have been going on in this church of Corinth. And so I wanted to circle back um, one more time to just pick up um, in chapter 4 and complete this section that Paul is really um, speaking to, you know, um, the divisions and um, what was going on um, in, in that, 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 that segment, that entire section of First Corinthians. And so um, today our conversation is going to circle around um, the conditions of Christ's servants constrain Christian Conduct. That's a lot to say. Condition of Christ's servants and how um, constrained they were to their Christian conduct. So we'll dive into that just in, in just a moment. But before we do, just for context, because um, you know, I never can assume that everyone knows or everybody has been a part of, you know, our, our study and everything. I just want to circle back a little bit to the background of of the of what 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 um, the city of Corinth, as well as the people of Corinth and the church of Corinth. And so we know that um, the Corinth was a port city. It was a major thoroughfare where it was located on, um, on, on the waterfront. It connected ships to be able to bring their cargo in and to um, go then uh, go into other areas. And so it was a really important city of, um, of commerce. Uh, so people from all over the world came through Corinth and therefore the people that um, lived in Corinth were very much multicultural. They were from everywhere because of this. Um, we, there, um, there was also inside of the city of Corinth idols. And so one of the biggest idols that were, was there was the idol Aphrodite. Um, and so um, the Aphrodite was the goddess of love. And so, you know, there was a lot of um, promiscuousness there in the inside of their temple. They had um, 
prostitutes. It was a part of their religion. And so these are the people that were coming out of that lifestyle and from various countries, um, you know, that um, were the first to, you know, accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior and be a part of the church that is now located in Corinth. And so we find that, you know, um, the church of Corinth, they were, they were considered to be baby Christians, not because they were young in age, but, but because they were young in the faith. And so when Paul leaves this church, you know, after he had established it, he left Apollos in charge, who was basically the shepherd. He was the pastor over that, um, that church and was trying to um, teach them um, Christian conduct, teach them the word of God, teach them the, go the gospel and change their lifestyles at, um, so that it would conform to Christ. And so in the midst of all of this, of course, there were some disputes that were happening. There were some divisions. Who, who brought you into the church? Oh, Apollos brought me. Oh, Paul brought me. You know, that kind of thing was happening in the church. And so word got back to Paul, who had been in Ephesus, and um, about all of the things that were going on in this church of Corinth. And so that is what drove this letter that was written to them to um, speak to their issues, to speak to um, their disputes and the divisions and everything that were happening there. And so when we pick up in chapter four, we're going to lean into what Paul was trying now to convey to the church at Corinth, as well as what he's, he's also saying to you and I today. And he's talking about this condition of Christ's servants, all those who call themselves servants of Christ and how it constrains Christian conduct. That's a lot of C's, isn't it? Um, but I want to start with this first question that's on your screen. And hopefully those, uh, I'll, I'll try to um, reiterate things for those that are on the prayer line or um, that are unable to uh, see the screens. But in general, what conditions constrain or keep us from working properly? And I mean, it, it could be in the church, it could be in the work world, it can be at home. What, what stops us, what keeps us from being able to work properly? You can come off a of mute and talk to me. You can put it in the chat. But what are some of the things that constrain us? Go ahead, Alexis. Um, it, are we talking about even just emotionally? I know, I know, um, a lot of people. It's very difficult for them to work in, um, like high stress, toxic environments. Not that mm -hmm. anybody should be working there, but. <laughs> <laughs> toxic and, and like high stress and like stress like um to the point yeah. where you can not even think straight because 50,000 people are talking to you <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely I, I've seen people um you know leave their jobs because it's it's too stressful yep anything else I think my mom said um not enough resources not enough resources to do what it is that you're supposed to do Always yep. feel like you're trying to catch up just to get mm -hmm. there. But then when you get there, you got to catch up again. It's a lot. <laughs> yep. 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 I wrote down a few too, just to offer up some conversation and everything on. But what about some of these things? You know, when we think about constraints, what, what stops us being able to work properly, you know, sometimes time constraints do. We just don't have enough times in the day, like you said, Alexis, you know, to get things done. We can't take on yet another job or, you know, um, take on another function. And so, you know, time is, is a huge factor. Um, we sometimes have outside forces that are working against us, you know, um, weather we live up in the north a lot of times weather can play a part in this where we can't get to where we need to get to to do the job at hand or when physically not able to do the job you know if you put me out there on the construction um site to pick up cinder blocks i i got a problem with that i don't know if i could do that all day long because my body isn't physically able 
to do stuff like that. Um, I see Alexis put in here, communication at work is key. Yeah, bad communication, you it becomes a constraint. You can't get things done properly. Um, what else did I put up here? Ability to know how to do the job. Have you been trained? You know, um, sometimes, you know, people, my daughter right now is in a situation where they haven't trained her for the position that she is doing. And so she's trying to learn it as she does it. My old job was like that. They were like, you know, um, we're going to build the airplane as we're building it. I'd be doggone if I want to get in a plane like that, right? You know, you're building the plane as we're, <laughs> as, as we're flying it. That, that, that kind of difficult to do and it becomes a constraint and then what about some of these other things you know what constrains us when we think about you know some of the teams that we have to work on you know uh, do we get along well with those that are on the team that would uh, compel us to want to work on that team and to do a great job or sometimes like are, are we just lazy lazy where we don't want to do do it, period. I, we got the time. Yeah, we got the ability. Yeah, but we're physically able to do it, but we're just, we just don't want to. And sometimes, you know, we don't even realize that there's work to do. You know, I, I think about, you know, like on a Sunday morning, you know, we, we have folks that come into the church and enter into worship and everything else. And that's wonderful. But nobody, sometimes we don't understand all of the work that has happened behind the scenes for us to be able to come into the edifice and be able to worship. Somebody had to keep the lights on. Somebody had to clean the building. Somebody had to prepare um, a message. Somebody had to um, practice their their notes and 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 um, instruments. You know, it, it's a lot that goes on. But many times, though, we we take it for granted that all of that just happens and we sometimes can be oblivious to all of the many hands that are working behind the scenes to bring forward a worship service or you know um or what or even with a project you know all of the many hands that bring a project to fruition um i think i see something else in the comments leadership issues yeah what happens when there's leadership issues and they're not giving you proper instructions as to how to move forward. You're going one way and leadership wants to go the other way. Well, that's a problem and that can harm us, hurt us from being able to work properly. And that leads into where we're going at today. You know, when we're talking about 1 Corinthians 4, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and turn there. But um, these were some of the issues that were happening also in the Church of Corinth. And then we're, we're going to actually hear um, Paul's response to it. All right, let, let's begin. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, which is on your screen. It says, think of us in this way as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they should be found trustworthy. So in this verse, I just wanna break some of the things apart because there's so many nuggets that are in just this one verse, these two verses alone. It, Paul says that we're all called servants, right? Um, in, the King, in the King James Version, the word that is used there is ministers. And I'm kind of glad that, you know, this version calls us servants because when we say ministers, a lot of people get nervous. Oh, I'm not a minister. I'm not called to preach, you know, and, and, and they take it to a whole nother level. But basically a minister is a servant. That's what we are. We are called to serve. If we are not able to serve, then we are not really ministers. So whether we stand up on a Sunday morning in the pulpit, or if we're talking to folks in the supermarket, or if we're just hanging out with our friends, it doesn't change who we are called to be. We're called to be a servant. And whether you know it or not, you are preaching something. So whether it comes out of your, your actual mouth, 
you know, or whether it even comes out of your actions, um, you're preaching something. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, he says, we are living epistles, where he says, um, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts to be known and ready by all. We're living epistles. We are constantly preaching. That and 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 I, I I'm just taken back by that a little bit because you know it makes us self reflect. You know when we think about that that we are always preaching whether it's in our actions or in our deeds. Did we do a good job today? You know, if if if, if this if if this were a Sunday morning and you were the one that was in the pulpit based upon your actions today and the words that you said today. Would God be pleased? Hmm. You know? All right. And so if we're called servants or ministers, we also find that there's, if all of us are called that, that there's no big eyes and little use because we're all on the same playing field. We all have the same responsibility um, as servants, right? And the scripture goes on to say that not only are we servants, but we are stewards. What's a steward? What's a steward? I would say that they're so, entrusted with our work. Someone in, say that one more time. Someone entrusted with our work, you said? Yeah, somebody that is entrusted to do a particular work. Mm-hmm. And Alicia put in the chat a caretaker. Yeah, I mean, um, in in during Paul's day, um, a, a steward was a person who took care of someone's home. He was he was um, in charge of the owner's home, and he had to make sure that the house had everything that it needed, that it was fully stocked with food and and with supplies. And so, not only did he have to ensure that the the house had everything that was needed but he also was the one who gave it out according to the needs of the people of the house. He was more or less the Oprah of their day and you get some and you get some and, and you get some. <laughs> that, that's who he, you know, a, a steward was. And so it is also in the house of God. If we're born again believers, we're servants and we're stewards. And so um, in the house of God, um, we should be able to be able to do those functions of taking care of God's house, right? As well as, you know, um, offering to unto others. What are we good? What are we to be stewards over? What does the rest of this verse say? We're servants of Christ and stewards of God's mystery. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to be giving out. And so what is the mystery? Biblically saying, speaking, what is a mystery? Something that is not known to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that is not yet known to everyone. Something that was concealed, right? That's how we usually say it when we speak about the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there were some things that were concealed that the New Testament had revealed, for instance, the sacrificial system in the Old Testament where they use lambs and goats and, and bulls and things like that. Um, in the New Testament, we see that no longer do we have to do that, but it was Jesus who was that sacrificial lamb. Here's another one, and I'm going um, that was a mystery, and you have to unscramble that word. Um, if you can, just come off a of mute and say it. Uh, but this was a mystery because it was not revealed in the Old Testament. Anybody can unscramble that word? Alicia, I knew you were on it. The second it came over, I knew you were on it. <laughs> it is the, the gospel, yes. Can we think of any other mystery in the New Testament that um, was not revealed in the Old Testament? One that we are a part of. It has you, and you are a part of it. I don't know in if the middle a, of it. I don't know uh, if this is a, um, a children's church answer, but Jesus. 
<laughs> oh, you're so cute. Um, but it, it's the church, right? The church was not revealed in the Old Testament, but the church is part of the new. And yes, Jesus is in the church. See how we always make a Sunday school answer, right? <laughs> Yes, but um, you know that was a mystery in the New Test um, that that was uh, revealed in the New Testament. The and as well as the Holy Spirit being indwelt inside of us in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon them, but never was in them to form to uh, perform for certain functions. Grace, yes, grace, love it. Yes. So those are, are, are some of the mysteries. Now here, Paul is actually talking about the gospel. Um, and, um, and what is the gospel? What is the gospel? We're getting ready to approach Easter. This is a question that, <laughs> you know, we, we, an answer that we already answered that we should have. What is the gospel? Come on, y'all. That Jesus... <laughs> Come the on, son of God that he was born and he lived a life without lie. sin he died on the cross for our sin was resurrected and interceding on our behalf in heaven for us that we have the access go. to everlasting life we should be like popcorn on that one right, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll, I'll offer this scripture to you all because this is one that you should really have in your tool belt and that's first corinthians chapter 15 verses three and four wow. and it says for i handed on to you as of first importance what i in turn had received and here it is that christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's one we ought to have in our tool belt. That is the gospel. And so we're called to be good. We're called to be stewards over this gospel to receive it unto ourselves, but also to be able to give it out to others, to share the good news of the gospel, to share the love of God, to get this, all mankind, all mankind. And it tells us in verse two, moreover, that it's required of stewards that they should be found what? It's on the screen. Trustworthy. Faithful. Trustworthy. Faithful. Trustworthy. Faithful. Mm -hmm. Faithful. That's what we're called to do. Um, does it say that we are found that we um ought to be what eloquent in speech? <laughs> no. No. Does it say that we have to be well off where we have it overabundance so that we can help somebody? Nope. You mean like rich or something? Mm-hmm. Is that what it's telling us in this? No, script? no. No. It's it, it it's merely saying the only thing he's asking us of us is that we're trustworthy, mm -hmm. that we're faithful, right? That's yeah. not a that's not a hard requirement you know, for us to just be faithful. He's been faithful to us, right? And so he's asking us to do likewise to one another as, and as we do unto others, we are doing unto him. All right. So verses three, oh good, I'm still in good time. Let's look at um, this next part where Paul is, is now talking about judging. And so um, this past Sunday, I shared, you know, an example of, you know, of judging, you know, where um, the, the, the um, show the real and what they used to do at the end of that with the L train, where we had to judge two videos that were doing outrageous things to each other. And one of them would get the L, which was considered to be the loser track and everything, you know, that they did something that was just totally out of out of out of sorts and everything but are we supposed to judge are we i say to i say i say there is a, a judgment that is for the believer mm -hmm. it's um, sounding out of but there the, but there is a form of judgment that god is telling us not to have ah 
Uh, so not... to be a judge means that we pronounce sentence. And when we judge, so when we judge somebody, you know, we are not to condemn that individual. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think um, is a problem with a lot of believers today. They feel like you can't tell them anything because it's a form of judgment. You're, you're putting me down. You're not really building me up. But they, but that's why. Um, and then we can find this throughout the scripture. But um, you know, he, the the Bible teaches us that we shouldn't judge a person in that sense. If we go back to um, Matthew 7, it says, judge not lest you be judged, for the same judgment by which you judge, you shall, it shall be meted unto you or should be measured again unto you. Mm -hmm. But then he goes into the whole splinter in a person's eye. How can you see that? With, You're getting ahead of me. With that log <laughs> in your own eye and all of that kind of stuff. But what he goes on to say after that, he says, once then you remove that, then you can see clearly that you may be able to what judge judge your brother or help him in his situation, you know. So a lot of times, though, I think that's it's it's almost like a, a Christian. It's an issue in in Christian in Christendom where people don't want to be they don't want to be told that okay their action may be incorrect. If the world, the, the world already doesn't like that, how can we not lift one another up? That's, that's, mm -hmm. I'm not going to use the word that popped in my mind initially, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Cause I see a couple mm -hmm. more. No, no, no. Cause oh, you, you're definitely touching on some of the points I wanted to raise. Go ahead, Carol. Yeah. Um, I think too, that we need to be able to know the works of the flesh and be able to judge the sin but not condemn the person in judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the sin, not the sinner. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Let's look, let's look at the, at these verses and then we'll dive, dive deeper in it. It says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. I do not even judge myself. I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, mm -hmm. who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each will receive commendation from God. And so what we're seeing here is that Paul is actually talking about three different courts of opinion, right? Mm -hmm. The first one is, let me see, let me get there. The court of public opinion. And unfortunately in the culture that we live in today, this one is a major issue. You know, people can't even get to in, inside of a courthouse to be heard by a judge because, um, you know, the court of public opinion has already casted what their vote is and people are condemned already. And so, you know, we're, 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 we've become very sensitive to this because we're many times we're afraid to be judged by others, you know, um, so much so that it constrains us going back to our, our theme and everything for tonight. It constrains us from being able to do the work that God has called us to do. We, we um, because of public opinion and everything, we then, you know, um, walk so many walk in fear, you know, that we're not, we, we, we choose not to open our mouths when we should be opening our mouths because we're afraid that we may not say it right. You know, we, we choose not to pray in public because what if somebody hears me and I don't say, you, I don't speak in complete sentences and using all of those theological terms and everything else. You know, I'm not, um, my speech isn't poised enough to be able to do, you know, um, to be able to pray in, perf in, in, in public. Um, what if I'm not received? If, you know, I, I go out there to do this, you know, I, I think I'm doing a good thing. You know, I know God has placed it on my heart, but, you know, I'm not received by the people, you know, 
and court of public opinion will constrain us, will constrain us. What if we're laughed at? You know, how hard is it to then go back and do it again? You know, and so we, this is one of the courts and everything that is a legitimate court that's out there that we have to face um, each, and, each and every day. And Paul, he was constantly being critiqued and criticized. And, um, and at times we see that it did bother him to his core. Matter of fact, when we open up this book of 1 Corinthians, what's the first thing we see? We see him, you know, defending who he was that he was called to be an apostle, right? And so we also know that Paul was not eloquent in speaking as well. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse six, he says, I may be untrained in speech, but, but not in knowledge. Certainly in every way and in all things, we have made this evident to you. He's talking about himself. He wasn't trained in speech, you know, but he, 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 he spoke out of his heart. He spoke out of his, his understanding, his wisdom, and, and, and his study of the word of God. And it came out as it came out. They imprisoned Paul because they didn't like what they heard him saying. Later on in this chapter, and we're not going to be able to get to it this evening, but I encourage you to read on, you know, in, in verses 11 through 13, it says, to this present hour, we're hungry and we're thirsty and we're poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we grow weary from the work of our own hands. But he didn't let the court of public opinion stop him from being a good steward, from being a minister of the gospel. And the latter part of verse 12, it tells us, it shows us his response. And this may be something that we can glean from his response to um, the court of public opinion. He says, uh, when reviled, which basically means when you're hated, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, what do we do? We speak kindly. Wow. When I say taking on, you know, the, the, um, the character of Christ, Paul definitely reiterated um, that to us in those verses. And so then the second court that is mentioned in this text that's on your screen is the court of our own consciousness. We judge ourselves. Paul says, I do not even judge myself. And so when we judge ourselves, you know, um, we are extreme. We're either extreme left or extreme right. Mm -hmm. Very rarely do we fall right in between. And so when I speak of extreme left and extreme right, let's start with, with one end of the pen, uh, pendulum um, where we judge ourselves sometimes so nonchalantly, right? about our behavior, or we may even justify our actions according to our own standards. And sometimes we blame our character flaws on others. Well, my dad was a mean son of a gun, so therefore I'm a mean son of a gun. <laughs> mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, we have this better than syndrome as well, where we, we will sit up there and, and judge ourselves according to others that we perceive to be less than ourselves. And so like for instance, if I were a smoker, I would say, yeah, well, I smoke cigarettes, but he smokes weed, you know? <laughs> or I go to church on first Sunday, every first Sunday, but they only go on Easter or on, or on Mother's Day. You know, I give this amount, but they only get that amount. You know, and so we do that sometimes where we've created our own standard of judgment, where we put ourselves on that pedestal. And we even see that in the scripture with David, right? Didn't David do this? 
um, look at second, second Samuel chapter 12, I believe it is, where we see how um, Nathan had to spell it out to David and he used a parable in doing it, where he talked about this rich man who had many sheep and many cattle and this poor man who had one little lamb that he used to adore and take care of and rub and hold and, and all of that. And Nathan had talked about how this rich man, instead of taking out of his abundance, one of the lambs that were used that he had took this poor man's lamb and slaughtered it to make a meal. And he, and and David immediately um, became upset and angry and said, "Oh, you should kill that man. You know, he should pay back four times as much for killing that little lamb." And how David sat on his self righteous pedestal and he was casting this harsh judgment for someone else until Nathan said, ah, ah, you know what? I'm talking about you, how you own all of this land and you have all of these wives and you have all of this property and yet you stole Uriah's wife. You took Bathsheba and then you put Uriah on the front line where he was killed by the Amorites. And so David had to self, self reflect and look at himself, you know, and compare himself now and be convicted of the same judgment that he had was trying to cast to someone else. What happens when that becomes you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so going back to what you were saying, um, Reg, with Matthew chapter seven, do not judge so that you may not be judged, right? And and when we're looking at this this plank in our and in, in, when we're looking at this speck in someone else's eye, don't forget about the plank that's in our own eyes. Start with that first before we start criticizing and judging others. And then we have the other side of the spectrum, right? Where not we're not, we're not nonchalant, but we sometimes take ourselves too seriously where we can sometimes make ourselves ineffective, ineffective right? Um, we take sometimes our, our ailments and we magnify them and they become a crutch to us where it constrains us from being able to do the work of ministry. For instance, one person may say, I stutter, so I can't ever you know, go out and tell someone about Christ. I can never minister to anyone. I can never do this and I can never do that. Not so, not so. I, I, I think about, you know, there were several people, you know, that, that shared their testimony. One being Tony Evans, another one being T.D. Jakes, and a third um, is um, Steve Harvey. And all of them had speech impediments where they stuttered and couldn't speak. And now look at what they're doing. You know, they're out there on mainstream platforms, many, um, either preaching or teaching or ministering or doing, you know, grabbing the attention of people using their mouths. So it's not an excuse. Some excuses people come up with is, I didn't go to college, so I can't teach. Why can't you teach? Study what's in front of you. You know, if you have questions, ask them. It's okay. We all don't get it right every now and again. But that should not stop you from moving forward to being able to tell someone the good news of the gospel, to be able to share with them, you know, the scripture. Sometimes, you know, it's about who, who we're close to. I can't do that because I'm not close to that individual. I don't have that role. I, we find so many times excuses as to why we can't do things. And we judge ourselves because we're putting folks on pedestals that not necessarily they deserve or ask for. You know, again, no big eyes, no little use. And so I'm going to stop there on, on that. And, and for the sake of time, head to the last um, court. And this one is the one that really matters. This is the Supreme Court. This is God's court. Paul says, I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Because basically 
he's saying it doesn't matter how folks judge you according to their standards, right? And it doesn't matter how you judge yourself against your own standards. The only one that really matters is how God will judge us against, get this, his standards. And so we see, we may see ourselves, um, we may see things in our lives that line up and sometimes don't line up to the word of God, you know, but the, the thing is that, is that as we um, know better, we ought to do better. And that's why we ought, we have to continually be um, diligent in studying the word of God in sharpening ourselves in um, being prayerful to be that better person um, and aligning ourselves up to the word of God. First Corinthians 13 tells us when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I behaved as a child, you know, but when I was a man, I, I did what? I put away all of those childish things. So, you know, sometimes we're convicted of our wrongdoings, you know, um, we sometimes, how do I put this? Um, we have convictions in our heart, you know, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're not so right. For instance, you know, I, I, I've heard um, some of our elders used to say, well, I'm walking in righteous indignation, but sometimes it's, some, it's just foolish arrogance if it's not according to the word of God. You know, back in the day, there were preachers that were out there preaching this prosper, prosperity theology. And coming forward to now, many of them are apologizing for that because they led people astray because it was not full understanding. Yes, um, the word of God tells us that we ought to be prosperous, but we don't have to have six figure salaries and million dollar bank accounts for us to be considered prosperous, right? Because if we look at the word of God, we see that, you know, a little boy's lunch was 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 prosperous to a multitude. We see that a little a, a, a middle a widow's might was 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 prosperous, you know. Um those empty vessels and everything were something of value because they were filled. And so we can't judge ourselves on or um or or we can't judge ourselves on material things um like prosperity theology was, was teaching. So you know, in that, you know, that judgment um, of not hitting the mark, of preaching something that was not right, I'm glad that many of them came back to apologize and to set the record straight and to show people the right way, um, how to rightly divide the word of God so that, you know, we don't um, add a burden to people that are already struggling. You know, prosperity doesn't necessarily have to be money. You know, we can be prosperous in our health. And I tell you, a, a sick, rich person will take um, being poor and healthy any day over all of those dollars, right? And so I see uh, the time um, go up. So let me just uh, finish this really quickly. So God judges the heart. You know, that's one thing that we really have to understand. God understands our motives. He understands our intent. And so sometimes when, you know, we may not necessarily get it right, God will say it's right because he understands why we did what we did when man only sees what we did. And so, you know, I, I'm happy with understanding, you know, that um, our judgment will come from God. And he is the one who sees everything that happens in the dark. I remember my mom used to tell me what happens in the dark will come to light. You know, he understands. He knows all of those things. You know, going back to uh, Matthew chapter five, when it's talking about adultery, you know, even though the person didn't actually um, carry out adultery physically, but he was thinking it. he had already been judged because of his because of what was in his mind, what was in his heart. And so God judges our hearts and there's going to become a reckoning you know where um we will receive commendation for those things um that we have done right you know thank god we don't have to worry about 
you know, being condemned because Jesus has already paid the price for us um, and has, has bore all of our sins, but there's going to be commendations for us, crowns that will be given unto us. And I, I think about, you know, Revelation chapter, um, when he's speaking to all of the churches, you know, he was able to see the good, the bad, and the ugly of those churches. And yet in all of them, except for Laodicea, you know, there was a commendation, even though they didn't do everything right, though that in which they did do right, God saw. And so we are grateful for that. God judges. And so I leave you with that. I won't go on to the last screen, but um, you know, there is one question on here that I do want to leave you with. If Christ were to come today, where would we stand? And so I, I leave you with that. If Christ were to come today, where would we stand? If we're holding up the plumb line, you know, um, according to his standards, where would we stand? If Christ were to come today, did we make did we make him proud in our actions? You know, um, Something, something to think about, or, or did we fall into some of those constraints? Were we lazy? Did we just were oblivious of to what we, what we were called to do? To be stewards, to be servants. Were we? Um, what did we? Was the ta Do we think that the task was too great? Well, God will never put more on us than what we are able to do. You know. So think about those things. Did we make the Lord smile? Did we make him I want to I want to make you smile. Yes, yes. Yes. All right. I'm going to close this out in the word of prayer. Any last thoughts before we close this evening? So good to see some new faces and names come up on the screen. God bless you. I wanted to say something real fast. Mm -hmm. Something I heard um a little while ago, but I've been I've been using it a lot now recently. And it was, it was said, judgment without compassion is bullying. And I've heard mm -hmm. that. I, I've, I've really learned to understand that now as, as an adult. But when I first heard that, it was really in a conversation talking about how we do need to be more empathetic and more compassionate to people, not just as people, but as Christians, because we are afforded so much patience and compassion and understanding from God that how can we then as humans turn to another human and be like, you're not even worthy of that. If I'm worthy of it, then you're worthy of it too. Especially people who don't even know how good God can truly be. It's like, yeah. we have to be even more compassionate, even more understanding and, and sympathetic even. Cause it's like, you're missing out and I'm only here to help. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't teach love or hate. It's just impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah. And words hurt. You know, we have to, we, we, there's the old saying, you know, I'm sticks and stones may break, break my bones, but words will never hurt. That's not true. Words hurt. Words can hurt. And so, yeah, we definitely need to, um, you know, be compassionate when we're judging to, to do it in love, to do it in love. Let us pray. Father, thank you. God, thank you for um, this lesson, Lord. Thank you for opening our eyes in regards to judging and judgment, oh God. Thank you, God, that you are our ultimate judge. Lord, that we seek to make you proud. We seek to make you smile, oh God. So even now, Lord, God, as um, we are coming upon the precipice of this evening, Lord, and even for tomorrow and days and days and days to come. Lord, help us, Lord, to understand, Lord, and to walk, Lord, a life worthy um, that would make you proud, oh God, that we would be good stewards, God, for you have called us to be servants, Lord, and stewards of your word, oh God, of this mystery, this gospel, Lord. Help us, Lord, to go about and to tell others about Christ, Lord. Help us, Lord, to do um, the assignments in which you have uh, given unto us, for you have given each one of us assignments and gifts and call and a calling, Lord. So help us, Lord, to walk therein so that this world would be blessed, that we would be lights shining in the midst of darkness, Lord, 
And we thank you, God, that um, light does cast away darkness, oh God, and we pray that your light would forever shine. So Lord, as we um, conclude this evening, Lord, we pray that you would be with us, um, guiding us through the night, protect our homes, protect our families, we pray. Give us sweet rest, Lord, and wake us in the morning where we can continue to serve you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening. God bless you. Thank you, servant Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Have a good evening.